Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming out and well, not coming out for staying home and joining us this evening. Um, I am. I want to let you know we, we've got a couple of our upcoming programs for June and July. So for June 7th, we have part two of geocentrism. So I'm not sure how many of you had attended part one. That was way back before COVID. We're going to have part two of that. And then for July, we're going to have a program about photographing the sun and the moon. So that one should be pretty interesting. So I also want to let you guys know that we will be recording tonight's program. So if you're more comfortable turning off your camera or maybe changing your name in the chat, you might want to go ahead and do that. And then afterwards, it will be posted on the Geauga Skywatchers YouTube channel. So you go there to find it. Just go onto YouTube. If you subscribe, then you get access to all of the ones that have been posted. If not, I believe it's just the most recent uploads or you know, the first five or something like that, I think. So, but today we have with us uh, Becky Parkin. She's the Assistant Chief of Outdoor Education at Lake Metro Parks. And she's gonna talk to us today about ancient astronomy. So thank you, Becky, for joining us. And I'll kind of turn it over to you here. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. I am very excited to talk to you tonight about one of my favorite topics in astronomy. Um, I'm just gonna real quickly switch to make sure that you can all see my PowerPoint. How's that look? Great? Yes, very good. Okay. okay. And can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, great. There may be a couple of things that I'm going to point out to you tonight. So um, throughout this whole time, please feel free if you want to send a question or comment into the chat. If you are have a question that just, you know, just you wanna ask right away, you are more than welcome to chime in and ask a question and we'll go from there, all right? This is a, a fun topic. This may be something that you are very familiar with or at least some of the things that I'm gonna talk about tonight that you're familiar with. There may be things that you have never thought of before. So. The, the big clue to everything that we're talking about tonight is this picture of, most of you probably know, Stonehenge. And Stonehenge is an amazing uh, megalith that is in England. I actually had a chance to go and see it one, one point and it was truly amazing, but there's a lot of not so known places that we're gonna talk about as well. So let's dig into exactly what is archaeoastronomy, right? So here's, here's where we want to start, sort of at that very beginning, to understand what is happening in our night sky. Why did people in ancient times build incredible structures? What were they doing that they were so dependent on that night sky? And so to understand, we want to know that archaeoastronomy or ancient astronomy, depending on what, what you want to call it, is really the study of how people understood the phenomena of the night sky, how they used that phenomena, and then how did that play a role in their everyday life and in their culture. And so we study it, we want to know the astronomical practices and the, the lore behind it. And that's what we're sort of going to dig into a little bit tonight. So in order to understand a little bit more of what is happening, we, you sort of have to understand why was astronomy important? So we're talking about cultures and ancient civilizations from three, three to 5,000 years ago, thousands of years ago with people looking to the night sky to understand what was happening. We, we have to remember that there was no electricity. Most people did not read. Sometimes there wasn't even a written language when some of these things were starting to be understood and, and figured out. And so the night sky was used not only as a, a way to understand what was happening in your everyday life, it was also a way to teach great stories and myths and, and sort of the morals and ethics of the time. People weren't living day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour, using, using these like we do now, it was really great if you could understand what was happening in the relative future. So in a few weeks, you were living by weeks instead of minutes and seconds like we live now. So 
understanding astronomy and how it played a role in ancient cultures is the big thing that we're talking about. So we, we know that ancient cultures, in order to, um, in order to function, they used astronomy because it was a great way to um, tell a great precise method for time. Um, they always used it for monitoring agricultural issues and, and events and planting and harvesting and when was the rain coming? When was it gonna be the dry season? They, they used the night sky for all of that. And also it was a huge part of religious ceremonies. And also even this regulating governmental activities. So, so it was it was used in every way of life. We we sort of stand back and don't use that as much anymore. So we know that the night sky was used as a guide to everyday life. And that's where a lot of these places played a huge role in, in the ancient times. Right. This is a great picture. This is from China, about 700 AD. Okay. And this is showing you some constellations that probably if you look closely, you will recognize these shapes, at least one or two that stand out. And so in order to have a group of people being able to look at the night sky and observe and to wonder and, 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 and inquiry about what is happening, the best way in order for these observations to begin was that there was language and communication between the people in these cultures and that they had ideas of mathematical principles and that this culture lasted. You know, we have had many groups of people come and go, things shift, but in order for people to really study the night sky, they needed to be able to have months and years and years and years to start to understand those cyclical events, those patterns, those those things that they could depend on and rely on. And so with that as your basis, that could, could really help you set up your buildings, how to align them, how to follow the night sky and the planets and all of those things. So knowing that, let's start at the super, super beginning. Now we know there were lots of ancient cultures and we also understand that there were, there are certain um, con uh, constellations, mythology, stories that maybe we tend to learn more about certain cultures than others. But the big thing to remember is that at the same time I'm talking about right now with Babylonia and ancient Mesopotamia, the the, the people of India were, were certainly, and Egypt were certainly all looking to the night sky and understanding this as well. And so our present day astronomy that we, we often hear about, or when we're walking out in our backyards, we are looking at constellations of the night sky that are based on the Babylonian and Sumerians. They, they were sort of that basis that then the Greeks and Romans stemmed from. And that's, that's mainly what we talk about, but certainly there's all different cultures. So if you look at this, we're talking about a group of people who at 3,500 BC, we're that's 5,000 years ago, we're looking up at the night sky and starting to really figure things out and understanding what was happening. So with their basis that they understood and followed, we have come up with some of these constellations and, and groupings of stars that you may find uh, recognizable. So understanding that early people most likely didn't understand the night sky the way we do now, but that does not mean that they couldn't use all of this information to their, to their benefit. So even if they didn't understand the specific movements of the celestial objects, they certainly most definitely understood that things were predictable, that they could look at the night sky, they could look at all of these different stars and these patterns that they have come up with, essentially connecting the dots, and that they could then realize when they saw certain constellations, certain stars, that they would know what to do sort of next in their, in their life. So they understood they could measure positions, they, they established alignments, and and these stars served as devices essentially to monitor what was going on. 
And I wanted to point out very quickly this grouping of stars. You, you may or may not have heard of these before, but this is a great grouping of constellations slash another awesome word called Ursa, I'm sorry, a, called an asterism that is in our night sky. Most of us know this guy right here. This is actually part of a constellation, Ursa Major. This guy right here is our Big Dipper. And that actually is something called an asterism. So it, it's a picture within a constellation. We just get to be able to see these great seven stars right here often because it's still, even though we have lights on in our cities and our towns, it, these stars are still bright enough. And these are the guys that, that really lead our way to sort of find our, our path through the night sky. So we have Ursa Major, which it is actually a whole constellation here. This is just sort of the, the, the hip and the tail of the big bear. We have Ursa Minor, which is the little bear. And sometimes I look at all these constellations and I think there was some incredible imagination 5,000, 3,000 years ago when they're looking at these different groupings of stars and coming up with these fantastic pictures. There may be something else that you recognize called Cepheus. That's a little trickier one, but the big one we probably, a lot of us at least have an idea that there's a giant W or giant M in the night sky is Cassiopeia. And so Cassiopeia and Cepheus and this guy right here, if anybody here has read Harry Potter, you may recognize that a character is named Draco. There's actually a lot of different Harry Potter characters that are named for constellations and stars in the night sky. But these guys all spin around this most important star that we know today. This is our North Star or Polaris. And so we could go outside, we could walk, find this star and we would be able to know which way is north, which way is south, east and west. And if you've watched a lot of survival shows, they still talk about find the north star. Where is that going to lead you and that's going to help you? So, so even as simple as which way is north could certainly help us and most definitely help all of those in ancient times. Okay. So I wanted to point this out because this is a major part of the basis of how we look at the night sky. Now we we look at the zodiac as as something that is um, more based in something we call astrology now instead of astronomy. And the zodiac is is a um, the way we we use it today is more of a pseudoscience. So so there's a lot of discussion about we know these words because of what our sign is, right? Our, our ast astrological sign. So I, so just a very quick detail, quick um, thought on this is most people know, well, I'm a this or I'm a that, like I'm a Taurus. I was born in April. And what you have to understand is it's not necessarily when your constellation that you're connected to is up in the night sky, it's where the sun and the constellation matched up during the daytime that dictates what your sign is. So it's maybe a little different than what we think. But the reason I'm showing you this is that's not what the ancient people use this for, not what the Babylonians and the Sumerians used these amazing 12 constellations. They use them for something completely different. And I gave you a hint there, there's 12 of them. And they followed the moon and the sun across the sky. These were used as a calendar. And so when you start to realize that these amazing constellations all through the zodiac, they actually were, were in the night sky where people wondered why the sun and the moon were following this line across the sky the same way. And if you look at this picture, this guy right here is the line we're talking about. Okay. This is called the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is this sort of imaginary line that goes across our night sky. And what humans figured out was if they were watching the night sky in the daytime sky, the sun always followed the same path as the moon and all the planets. 
And so it's no wonder that this, this line that they, imaginary line that they saw was where their most important constellations were, the zodiac, that showed them all about what the month was, what was happening next. If they knew that this one right here, if, if we knew this is Virgo right here, if we understood that when Virgo was low in the sky, then that was a point where we need to get ready to the fields, then that was that was sort of your key, right? At 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 nighttime, they would they would be able to see this and be able to help themselves out, sort of figure what was going on. So the zodiac is a much, much greater important important line of constellations throughout our night sky than maybe what we realized. And so all of these things became predictable. These were these were the pictures of constellations in their mind. These were the where the sun, the moon, the planets all were. And once that stood out, that was something that then completely turned everybody to understanding their everyday life. Right? So here are some objects of interest that the ancient peoples would have wanted to know what was happening. And several of these things you already understand or have heard of probably because we still talk about these today. So the sun, of course, would have been a major thing. We know that we have our solstices, which are the longest day, June 21st, we're coming to it, and our shortest day, December 21st. But we also have these equinoxes, which is where you have equal amount of day, equal amount of light, and we have, and dark, so light and dark, equal amounts, and that's in the spring, vernal, and autumnal, or the fall. So they were, they were following, they were able to predict these different dates, which led to celebrations and, and um, major parts of their everyday lives. They understood when things were rising and setting. They they understood that the sun was always sort of in the same spot at noon, depending on what time of year it was. If it was low on the horizon at noon, it was it was closer to December. If it was high, it was closer to June. So all of these things, they they all of these predictable things happened through the night sky and the daytime sky to help them. We know that the moon is also very predictable. We we call our months. The, from the moon, the moons, right, is how we say it. That, that's why we have that term, because of the moon, which helped us figure out months. Some other things that they would have looked at are very bright stars. So we sort of talked a little bit about our North Star, but our North Star is actually this very dim, boring star to us compared to some that really stand out and are vibrant and, and really stunning. There were many different bright stars that we still see today in the same constellations that would have helped understand what season we were in. So I just picked a couple of these. This is a really fantastic constellation called Capella. And Capella, well, the constellation is Auriga, but the star is Capella. So here's Capella sitting. Notice it's like a part of a goat Right? That's that's part of the story, which we're not going to get into tonight, but it's a neat story. But Capella was definitely, depending on where it was in the night sky, it it pushed and showed everybody when they should start to harvest. The rainy season was coming. OK, that was a big one. I put the uh, Pleiades in here. This is the moon and this is our uh, it's a cluster of stars called the Pleiades. You may recognize it as the seven sisters. You may think of you have a car sitting out in your in your yard. That's the Subaru. And if you look closely, that term Subaru means seven sisters. So it's you'll see there's seven stars on that emblem. This is what the Pleiades looks like blown up real close. But but the Pleiades were definitely they were a major grouping of stars that helped people understand that spring was coming to and that winter was finalizing itself and getting out of here, and it was now time to get your fields ready. I put um, this constellation in here, which you probably recognize. This is our great winter constellation called Orion. And Orion is full of bright stars. And it's a fantastic 
uh, midwinter constellation that just the stars look like jewels and they're amazing to see. But this guy right here, Betelgeuse, which if you look closely at this, this looks like a man's torso, his legs. Here's his arm and he's typically shown holding, holding like a club and his, his shield. This would be his shield right here. And here's his club. But what we see a lot of are these stars. And Betelgeuse, fittingly enough, means is Arabic for armpit of the giant, which I figure that's probably the best named star out there. Um, and Rigel is a very bright blue star that's down sort of, you could argue, is it his knee? Is it his foot? But down here. But these are bright stars that it could be uh, cloudy or hazy, and you'd still be able to see and understand what this constellation was doing where it was in the night sky to understand. And my favorite, favorite bright star is our brightest in the night sky. And this is called Sirius, right? And if anybody, this sort of goes back to Harry Potter, but when JK Rowling was writing her books, she used the name Sirius for one of the main characters. And I'm not gonna say much more in case you have not read these books. But the shape of a dog plays a huge role with Sirius in the story. And interestingly enough, this is the constellation Canis Major, or the big dog. And so Sirius being as bright as it is, most people think it's a planet. It's so bright. But we know that stars actually really do twinkle, like the song, and planets don't. So if you're ever looking out there, that's, that's the big thing to, to look at. So lots of different things that helped guide the way. And a couple more real quick, things that probably were actually a little more unsettling or disconcerting compared to knowing I'm always gonna see the sun and the stars in the same way. I'm always gonna see the planets move. I'm always gonna see the moon. Well, there's a couple of other things that would have happened that would have been major parts of, of the ancients' lives. And I put this one up here. This is a conjunction. So a conjunction is where two objects appear to be close in the sky. We know that they're not actually close, but from our viewpoint, we can see them. And this happened last year. So the great conjunction, if you notice, we had Saturn and Jupiter get very, very close together to the point where they almost looked like this vibrantly huge, bright ball of light in the night sky. And it just so happened that it was December 21st, 2020. But you can see how things would move closer and closer and closer together. And that is absolutely predictable. Same with eclipses. Down below, we have sol a solar down here, which is the sun. And we have a lunar eclipse. Now, imagine if you had never seen one of these. And the moon started to turn this color. You probably took that as maybe something that was not good, even though we understand it's just how the sun and the moon and the earth are all moving together. But once they understood that it wasn't really going to do anything to them, they could also use eclipses and understand when that was predictable and whether that was they used the eclipses for good or to, to maybe uh, not scare people, but to sort of put them put them in their place maybe because they knew that certain things were going to happen and therefore they were able to predict that the moon was going to turn blood red or that the sun was going to be covered. So I'm sure someone somewhere certainly used that to their advantage, but it was still an absolutely predictable thing, right? And we're just going to skip past this guy because most of us are recognizable how a solar and lunar eclipse works. We know how that works now, but, but back then it was different. So that's sort of the big basics of everything, right? Understanding, you have all these layers, understanding what everybody was looking at, looking towards, and, and using um, in their everyday life led them to be absolutely dependent on the night sky. And so there's several things that were built and used and they they essentially have been dubbed as the methods of how things are observed 
So the men here were the standing stones, which that's Stonehenge, but there are so many different types of standing stones. Super, very large ones, very small ones, things in, in spheres, things in circles, things in lines. They were, they were used all over. And that was a lot of times we see a lot of standing stones in the British Isles. You might also build something using foresight. So as you're building something, you're looking at a, a mountain or a large, you know, when you think about like the Devil's Tower out, out west, it's a very conspicuous landmark that you then build something around or as that as your viewpoint. And we also think about people also built things so that when you were standing at a certain spot, you were able to observe and see these incredible astrological astronomical things happen. And that would have been back sight. So you may see these words thrown in there here and there, just sort of giving you an idea of these different ancient areas. So let's get into it. Here we go. Here's the big one. This is the one that everybody immediately thinks of. And this was sort of one of the, the first things that really caught my eye to understand and learn more about what was happening in the ancient times. What's interesting is about archaeoastronomy is we think we know what they did. We were pretty sure that we know, but we're but not sure absolutely 100% about all of these different places that I'm going to show you. And that to me is an amazing a, an amazing thought. You know, we live in a world where Everybody knows everything all the time. We can look things up. We can figure things out. We can question but and get those answers. But not always can we find the answers to things about ancient astronomy. And so Stonehenge has been known for many, many, many years. It was built, um, started in 3000 BC, and it was being built when the pyramids were being built. And a lot of times we don't put those two dates together, but it's this great connection to understand that people all over the world were absolutely building major, major things that were all about the night sky slash the daytime sky. And so there's these huge ginormous stones, right? These, these, these arches that, that, form the outer circle. And then in the inside, we have these things, those are called the blue stones. The blue stones are actually from Wales. So even though this is in England, they would have brought these huge blue stones um, from Wales. And so that's part of the mystery. How did they do this? How did these people move ginormous stones like this, gigantic stones? How did they, what was it used for? And one of the things that they do know is that depending on um, depending on where you stand looking at this, that it is absolutely aligned to the summer solstice. And we know the solstice would have been a huge, whether it was a celebration of life, most likely it was a celebration of life. Oftentimes the solstice of winter may have been more of a uh, celebration of death or a, or a thought of, of moving away from the darkness and into the light as, because they knew that at that point on December 21st, they were gonna shift and start to gain more light, right? So Stonehenge is sort of the picture, the, the poster, right? For all of these ancient places, there's, there's these standing stones and you could just Google standing stones and you would have hundreds of pictures. Um, I've been privileged enough to go to England and and Scotland and Wales, and they're just on the side of the road. And that's why I wanted to show you this picture. Oftentimes we think, oh, Stonehenge, this amazing place. Look at where Stonehenge is. This is the main road. So when you think about it, you're just, here's a big city right here. Oftentimes, not to destroy the mystique, but it's amazing to think that people were have just been living their daily lives driving by Stonehenge for for at least since cars, they were in carriages, they were walking. This is this road's been here a very long time. And so it gives you that perspective of how everyday life is is playing a role in these amazing ancient areas. So this is a great view from above. It sort of shows you how 
we think of Stonehenge as just this circular area, but actually there's huge, um, these are barrows, long barrows, and, and actually they have discovered many things far off in the distance that would have would have connected to Stonehenge as well. So, so this area was very active in ancient astronomy as a, they're not, they're not sure if it was used as a marketplace as well, but it definitely has to do with that summer solstice and that celebration. And I put a lot of maps in this presentation because I think sometimes it's really great to know, well, where, where are these things? So it sort of gives you an idea down here that here's London and here is Stonehenge. So it's not super far. Um, when I went to see it, it was this great drive out into the countryside to, to learn more about this. So Stonehenge is the first one. And the next one is we're sort of, we're going to be jumping over into Ireland, right? And this is called Newgrange. And I've never seen Newgrange. It's, it is certainly on my list of places to see because just it's enormous. Look at this. Look, here's the people. So this gives you an idea of this incredible size. You know, when we think about somebody building something 3300 BC to 2900 BC, we don't, they, they do have radically different tools and different ways of life than we have today. And if we set out to try and build something like this by hand, probably would take us a very long time as well. So hundreds of years, but New Grange is sits high on a hill in Ireland and it is aligned to the rising of the winter solstice. So we know that Stonehenge was summer. This is winter. They think that it is possible that it was of religious significance. But again, at this time, that long ago, it was not a written record like we have today. So, so we can look at things and wait for things to happen because we know that there's predictable solstices and equinoxes and things like that and wait to see what happens. And what you end up seeing is this is the door, right? And what they found out was that the sunlight enters this area right here, okay? Goes through this roof box is what this is called. Look at these incredible markings. Isn't that just stunning? What, what? The decoration. So it would have gone through this, through the door, and here's that top of the box. So the sun is coming in, and on that winter solstice, it goes through this hallway and hits this beautiful spiral that's on the back wall. So, and it hits absolutely in the center, not slightly over here, not slightly over here, absolutely on this spiral. And they're, they're not sure what is that significance other than understanding that it obviously was aligned to that solstice. And you can see New Grange is above Dublin in Ireland. This is, this is England and Scotland here. So again, it's another great spot that you can go and see, but this incredibly huge building, this structure that has been there for thousands and thousands of years and has been aligned with the solstice for all this time is still you could go, you could stand there, and you could see it. There'd be a lot of other people there with you, though, so just keep that in mind. But really, this amazing side of this ancient, this archaeoastronomy. Okay. This is also recognizable by many of us, right? The giant pyramids of Giza. Like I said, these were being built at the same time as Stonehenge, the same time as New Grange, but on a totally different part of the United, of the world. This is, we know it's considered a one of the wonders of the world. And we know that these were built not necessarily astronomically, but that they were built because they thought that as pharaohs, they would be buried in these, these huge pyramids, these three right here. And this is the three that we're looking at. And that this was a huge burial chamber, a, a uh, uh, area for them to spend their afterlife. What's interesting with all of this is that these sides are absolutely aligned to north, south, and east, and west. And if you ever want to see really the size of these, if you think you can't get to Giza, you could always go to um, Observatory Park, and they have 
actual cornerstones laid out to show you the incredible size of these pyramids. So something to consider if you're interested in that. But this, this is where archaeoastronomy gets a little interesting because we know that Stonehenge and Newgrange, they absolutely line up to a solstice, whether it's the winter or summer. There's been some talk and chatter that the pyramids are actually not in a nice straight line with what you would think, but they are actually aligned with Orion's belt. So there, the people are skeptical of this. There's constant discussion, constant figuring out. This is why I told you archaeoastronomy is so cool because you can stumble upon some really amazing things and figure things out. But if you take a look at this, these are the three, these are two stars in a nebula that are in the belt of Orion. And then this is, notice they're not in a perfect line. If they were in a straight line, it would be going like this, right? So here's two pyramids of Giza and then a small pyramid. And when these two are overlaid, it looks like this. Now, they don't know if that was on purpose. They don't know if, if it was actually something that happened, but some astronomers sort of put this together many, many years ago. And so there's been discussions since then, as you can tell, the, the, the uh, age of these screenshots. But I wanted to show you because notice the alignment is very, very close. And you can see that these pyramids are not in a perfectly straight line, which oftentimes when you look at these amazing pictures of the pyramids, they are. So just, just a, a cool thing to think about that, that is what possibly the ancient Egyptians were, were doing, right? So another cool part of ancient Egypt was this area called the precinct of Amun-Ra, this is a huge area. It's a huge part of a palace complex. There's major, major, many major buildings, very big. Built 2100 BC. So we're talking 4,000 years ago. And this is aligned to the midwinter solstice. So it is completely obvious that the ancient cultures, whether you were in England, whether you were in Egypt, you'll see some other cultures that we're going to talk about from the Americas, it was very important and very sacred to understand where and how the planets and sun and moon and stars were aligned. And so this would be one of those where we were talking about backsight, where you are standing at someone and you are looking, whereas some of the others you would be able to see if you were standing to the side because you would be able to see that light coming in at New Grange. So this is a really amazing place. This would be on my bucket list as well. And I put this on here. This here's where the pyramids are. This is Cairo. So you're looking at Cairo here, way down here. This is the Nile, right? Look at that fabulous V that it gives us. Here's the precinct. So they were very far away from each other. So understandable that the whole culture was very invested in these ancient astronomy practices and understanding what was going on around them. Jumping across the world, we jump into the Maya culture. And what's interesting is many cultures certainly studied the night sky, certainly have records that have been found. But what I was sort of focusing on tonight, because you could just talk about ancient astronomy for hours, I've been focusing more on which which areas actually still have buildings that are standing these structures that are still standing and so if you're wondering like why are we not talking about chinese astronomy well they did incredible things but as far as finding a lot of structures that's not compared to these other groups that we're talking about tonight so here's a phenomenal picture of chichen itza and um, also, um, this is an area, actually, this is um, Ushmal, is how you say that. That's, that, that's, sorry, I had to look at my notes to remember. Um, but 
things were built for alignment. And so within the Maya culture, you had this governor's palace. And we've talked a lot about the solstices and how things are aligned, but this palace was aligned to the rising of Venus, which when you think about that, that is an amazing thing that it happens every eight years where the star actually would rise on the corner of the palace. And that was what they believe was the reason this palace was built and the significance behind it. And it's covered in amazing glyphs of Venus and the Mayans had this whole zodiac zodiacal constellation grouping as well. So major, major importance if you are to build a building like this to have Venus align once every eight years. So that's talking about that continuity of culture, right? Where you're the culture is staying and thriving so that they can make these astronomical observations. Another amazing part of the Maya culture is this. This is El Caracol, which is, they believe, a possible observatory in Chichen Itza. And this would have been the 300s to 800s in the common era, right? So this is not as old as Egypt, but we're still talking thousands of years ago that this grouping of people were figuring out the night sky and really understanding the Mayan calendar is this incredible thing. It's so intricate that I'm not going to go into it at all, but just bringing it up that that they, the Mayan culture understood of what was going to happen at the year 2000 and, and, and everything happening as, as it, as they connected different glyphs and pictures and it's three wheels. It's been, it's this incredible, incredible, intricate calendar that's all built upon astronomy. So very, very important. This was a group of people who were very excited, okay? I'm charging forward. And this is just a picture of where it is. This is the Yucatan Peninsula. Okay. So here's where we switch though. So those may be some of the things that we recognize often. What I wanted to switch and tell you about is a really incredible ancient archaeoastronomy site that we have right here in our United States that some people may have seen, some people may not have, but it's in the Chaco Canyon. And the Chaco Canyon is in New Mexico. And if you see, here's the river. I put this whole picture of this map here to show you that you can go to this park. You can check different things out. And we are going to be focusing right in this area okay, for, for some of uh, what we're going to be talking about. But this Pueblo Bonito is one of the, the major areas. And I wanted to point this out because there's... When you look here, this is where we are heading right now in our next slide. Um, what, you're, what you see and what they had were these incredible villages. This is a, a model of what they think the village would have looked at. Notice each of these would have been houses and rooms and a town center and all built out of rock. Very, very it was a huge thriving area. Thousands of people lived here and it was in the 800s to the 1100s. So it was a, it was a great culture. And what's interesting is not only the shape, but how many of these buildings were aligned with solar and lunar cycles. What they, what they came to understand was that this was a, a culture as well as what we typically think of Stonehenge and, and the ancient Brits we know that the ancient people in the United States were also right there with them looking at things. And what was so interesting is in this area, so we're, we're looking here, right? We're looking back here. This is where Pueblo Bonito is. What I wanna show you is in that same area is our own very awesome archeoastronomy site. And it's called the Sun Dagger. And it was built in around 1000 AD. And what, what is a little different is, is that it's much smaller 
uh, than you might think Stonehenge or New Grange or a pyramid is. But what's interesting is that it wasn't found until 1977. So up on the Fajada Butte, okay, it's 135 meters above the canyon floor. So we're talking hundreds and hundreds of feet. There was a archeologist, Anna Sofer. She was actually categorizing all the petroglyphs, so all the, the paintings that are on all the cliffs. And she stumbled upon this shape, this this spiral carved into the rock like this. And it, it certainly looked different to her, but she wasn't exactly sure what it was until she realized that there were actually stones that had been lined up. And depending on when the celestial event was happening, whether it was the spring, the, uh, the equinoxes or the solstices, a line, a sun dagger, would line up onto these, these carvings on the back. And what is absolutely for sure is notice the summer solstice was probably why this was built. Straight in the middle, right in the back, you could see it's sort of carved onto the back and that would have been the summer solstice. And so you can see how interestingly enough on the equinoxes, they're on the sides, but also on this spiral, Whereas with the solstices, these are empty, but the dagger is either right here on the side or on either side. So that is a fantastic, fantastic part of um, what we have here in the United States. Now, the only trick is when they first studied this and everybody was very excited about it, everybody wanted to go see it. And what started to happen was so many people were visiting the sun dagger that erosion started to happen, which the rocks started to shift. So they stopped everybody from going up there. And now we just sort of have cool drawings and pictures this way of, of this sun dagger that is sitting high on the butte. So that's about what we have here in our area. And so that's a little taste of ancient astronomy, all these different cultures that were, were looking at the same night sky that we look at. They were studying and wondering just like we study and wonder. And it's pretty amazing. We're talking about ancient astronomy, but we're also living in a time where we are talking about sending people to the moon and sending people to Mars. And so it's a never ending story of what is happening in astronomy all around us. And I wanted to just leave you with this. If you love the night sky, which I'm sure everybody here does, otherwise you wouldn't be listening. If you want something a little different than just an app on your phone, because an app is great, but it just shows you a picture. It doesn't really help you understand what you're looking at. This is a great online uh, tool. This is called Sky Maps. You can get it right at skymaps.com. It changes each month. We're looking at it right now for May because that's where we are. But there's a couple of things I wanted to point out to you on this because not only does it show you what's happening throughout the month, it also shows you all the different things that you may be able to see. On the back of this, when you're looking at the PDF, it has like, what can you see with the naked eye? What can you see with binoculars? What can you see with the telescope? And here is what we talked about a little bit earlier. Here's that line, that ecliptic. And what you'll see is there's Mars. But if there were other planets up at this time in May, they would be following this as well. So it's neat to see. Here's those zodiac constellations just following right along on that ecliptic. And so I just wanted to leave you with that as a great tool to explore the night sky if you want to dive in and learn a couple of interesting facts. Um, besides using an app. So that's everything I have about um, ancient astronomy. And so I just wanted to see if anybody has any, any questions or thoughts or not. And other than that, I just want to say thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Becky, for joining us. That was very, very interesting. Um, I just see one thing in the chat. There are only six stars are visible in the yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
It's the seven sisters, but visible, we see six. Yep. Yeah. Has anybody ever traveled and seen any of the any of these ancient areas? Areas and places? I have been to the Yucatan and have seen uh, some of the ruins there. What I find so interesting, because I've studied archaeology, uh, not so much astronomy, but archaeology, what I find so interesting is these cultures that were supposedly in entirely, were in entirely different parts of the world, have the same interest in the stars, the moon, the sun, and the same ideas about it, that this yeah. knowledge was universal, mm -hmm. that it wasn't just isolated to different spots. I find yeah. that so fascinating. As do I. That's what I, I agree completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a great program. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. You ask if we've been there, uh, Becky. Uh, uh, I've uh, taken an inside tour of the pyramids and also was at the Karnak Temple that in, in the southern Egypt. And uh, Barb has been to New Grange and, and toured that facility. It's on my list. New Grange is definitely on the list. I would love to see all of it. Yeah. The, uh, the ruins that you pointed out, uh, the Pueblo, Bonita, mm -hmm. um, the National Park and the the other the Sun Dagger are uh -huh. all of those in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's all in that. Okay. It's, yes, it's all in that park. It's a, it's okay. a large complex. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Because mm -hmm. I'm planning a trip there in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have any more questions or? All right, well, thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you again, Becky. That was very, very interesting. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. All right. Well, everyone have a lovely evening and thank you again. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Amy. Thanks. <laughs>